cholera epidemic is over. Now, it took 20 years for medical science to discover the germ, the Vibrio germ that causes cholera. That was Robert Koch, and it was in 1870-something, 20 years. They, they would have had a lot more cholera in London if it hadn't been for the epidemiologist. You don't have to prove cause and effect to see something that's plain. that we've done, we found that that in fact is true. Um, but they, in fact, our uh, underground cables are much more efficient. Um, there's much more line loss. These high voltage power lines lose a lot of power. And so it's much more efficient to put them underground. If they're shielded, they do protect from an electromagnetic field. You can put shielding in the ground that, that protects the, 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 the wires from throwing up the electromagnetic fields. Um, and while there's an initial high overhead cost, when you think of the cost uh, the, the length of the time that the power lines are in service, 60 years, 50, 60 years, the overall cost, when you consider the maintenance, is much lower. So that overall, the, the undergrounding costs something, uh, something more. But one of the, uh, the uh, one of the pieces of information that we have from Alberta, Canada, said that they believe, based on the bids that they sent out and asking different companies around the world, that it would cost potentially about 15 cents higher, or 15 percent higher. Um, to build them underground uh, over the lifetime, the cost lifetime of the power line. So we think it's a much better plan and a much more, uh, uh, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you consider when you think about safety, uh, Alzheimer's, leukemia? Um, what's, what's the balance? A little bit of extra money, a little bit of extra power that we pay for our power, or, or that kind of health effects? That's, that's the balance we're talking about. Just so folks know, we've talked to the janitorial staff, they're going to give us another 10 minutes, so we'll try and go, we can go with questions until, until 10 after 8. And again, I'm, I'm trying to do my best I can to summarize, but I think that's a pretty good question. Um, why weren't CapEx 2020 and ATC Badger Blue Lines both presented to PSC at the same time? Well, I, I can address that. It's one of the main purposes of our project is due to a need to conserve the load in this lacrosse area. And that need is now. We, and we as CapEx presented this project because we feel like the need is now. ATC with their line came in after, after our line was already in the, in the permitting process. Um, it's just the way things are developed. It's, it's like uh, the highway system. You build one part of it, and then you build another part of it. You can't build the entire system at one time. It's built in phases. That's just the nature of building infrastructure. These kind of are uh, combined questions. I think I'm trying to combine a couple questions. What percentage increase can local electrical customers expect in the monthly electric bill as a result of this project? And what are the expected um, profits? And then the, the, this is Apologize of knowing the power usage average over the last five years and knowing the amount of energy that will be produced. Uh, again, what is the average profit on a yearly basis? Is there any estimates on what the profits from this project will be and what the increased cost will be? The, uh, the cost to a rate pair um, for the three CapEx projects, there's four projects. One of those projects, the, it's called the Brookings Project, that runs from Brookings, South Dakota to the Twin Cities. That project, the costs are being spread throughout the 12 state regions. Uh, the other uh, three projects are uh, spread throughout the four, four states. Uh, to an XL Energy customer, I only have the numbers for an XL Energy customer, um, at the height of construction for all the four projects, we expect that to be probably 2014, would be about $1.70, $1.80 a month uh, per customer at the height of construction. So right now, I think uh, probably 
20, January 2012, uh, I believe the XL Energy customers are paying uh, less than 30 cents uh, as because construction has not reached uh, anywhere near its uh, full cost. That will ramp up gradually to under $2 a month. And once, uh, once your uh, uh, construction is complete, those costs ramp back down. As far as uh, uh, profits of the utilities, uh, for, the, for this project, there's, there's five partners, as I showed in an earlier slide. Uh, four of those uh, uh, partners are nonprofits, uh, uh, so uh, I don't think it's an, an issue. Uh, the, uh, the fifth is XL Energy. Um, as a regulated utility in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the other two states, um, we are allowed to make about 10%, 10.2%, uh, I believe it is. That's, we have the opportunity to make that. Uh, I don't know that we've ever reached uh, quite that level uh, as far as 10.2%, but basically, uh, as an investor-owned utility, um, we have to promise investors something. Uh, uh, these lines, uh, generation plants, um, they cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we're not going to be able to serve you unless we can continue to keep those facilities operating. Uh, for us to be able to borrow money, uh, we have to uh, be able to promise our investors some type of return. Uh, those states, they look at every dollar we make each year, they review uh, what uh, uh, an investor-owned utility like XL makes, uh, and they see what the, the profit is. As I said, I think in Wisconsin, and James, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about 10.4%. 10 I don't believe we've reached that before, uh, but that's what we're allowed to make. So this is a, a general question, and if you'll be throwing again, um, why can the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service say no to the original peel on out to the black river bottoms when it's clearly at least costly, at least negative impact on residents in the shortest? It needs at least the uh, room, most shared room, and generally, I guess, according to this person, thinks but around. So why, why would the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service be able to um, say no to that route through the bottoms? Okay, I'm going to answer that question while I zoom in on the area that's being uh, asked about. And, and this this here is the, the Black River floodplain, and you can see it's a it's a forested uh, wetland floodplain. Um, the the existing power line that you can see uh, cut through the trees here. That goes through about one mile of uh, federal wildlife refuge land. And that's land that's owned by the federal government. And they, they have the ability to, to tell us that we can't go through there because it's, it's their land. Um, they, it's not, they, they say that it's not a compatible use for the land. It, it, in our opinion, at the beginning when we were uh, studying these routes, that did jump out at us as the route of the least impact. There's no people down there, there's already an existing power line corridor there, but in the end, it's, it's the Fish and Wildlife Service that manages that federal land, and we really have no recourse when they tell us we can't uh, go through their land. 